morning. Uh, I want to read a card that was sent to us. This is from uh, Dick and Terry Wark, uh, Mary Lou's daughter and son-in-law. Uh, it says, to the church body, thank you all for, for all your support you've given our family. It is amazing how caring and giving the church here has been during Dad's and Teddy's illness and passing. You've been so kind and caring to our family, bringing meals to us, helping us with the yard work, building Dad the ramp for, uh, sorry, the, I'm, she wrote in cursive. <laughs> the list of good deeds is long, but most of all, thank you for your prayers. Please use this money that was given to the donation uh, as we see fit. Uh, thank you all again. You are a wonderful church. Um, I got a text yesterday. Um, I, I, I want to commend Jesus Community Church because um, you guys are setting an incredible example of what Christians should be. Uh, I got a text yesterday from Chris. Um, thank you from my heart for all of you that showed up to help her. Um, it blessed her amazingly. Um, the friends of hers that were there that do not attend this church were blessed by the number of people that came and helped out. Um, I, I, I want to commend you that you are storing up treasures in heaven. What a, what a blessing you guys are. Um, I'm going to kind of reverse things here a little bit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the announcements first. Nathan loves it when I change things up on him. He's a free spirit. I've been planning this since before church started. And this is why I sneak those memory verses up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, next Saturday, we, are, we need a kind of micro church work day. Uh, all the dirt that's out there right now, we need to get seed laid down, um, we need to get it leveled out. Um, Dennis, what, where, where, where are you? Dennis, what else did you say needed to be done? Probably some, some leaves oh, you're here right. that need to be picked up and gotten off. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Many if, hands make work light. And if anybody has a little hand roller. I got one for like cookies. <laughs> <laughs> but actually I got two. You can get your knees dirty. <laughs> Youth group. Youth group, next Saturday. I'll give you my rolling pins. <laughs> um, Passion Play, this Wednesday, April 17th, at 7.30. Now, um, there is a sign-up sheet on the credenza. Uh, a room has been reserved at Jaker's if you want to eat there prior to the Passion Play. Um, we need to know how many people for the room at Jaker's. We need to know how many people from Jesus Community Church are going to the, the show so that we can reserve the right amount of seats. Okay, Sign-ups are on the credenza there. Yes, ma'am. Chris asked me to say... Um, I'm going to go ahead and take the sheet to her today, okay. this afternoon. Okay. So, um, so if anyone wants to be added beyond today, call, please. Call. Okay. Call Chris, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, her number is on the uh, church roster on the credenza. Um, Seder is this Friday, April 19th, um, 6 o'clock? 6 o'clock. It was pointed out to me this morning that um, we had not told anyone the time. Uh, so um, I said, talk to Christy. <laughs> and evidently it's six, so six o'clock. Uh, if anybody is available Friday earlier in the day to help us set up, that would be greatly appreciated. All of these chairs are taken out. We bring chairs from the other building in that are a little bit smaller so we can fit more people. We need to get the table set and, and all the decorations done. Um, so what, what time are we meeting Friday, Dennis? What, what time do you think, or Steve? 
Ten. My name is Des, but um, yeah, we're one. <laughs> you speak with his voice. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? What time? Ten, ten o'clock. Oh, yeah. Set up ten o'clock. Set up is at ten o'clock here. Um, I'm going to try and get the chairs out before Friday. So all we have to do is set the stuff up. So um, I love our youth group. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, sign-ups are on the credenza as well for the Seder. Uh, also, sign-ups uh, to bring food to help feed all the people here. Um, I'm not sure if we... Did, Jeannie, did you look at it or anybody look at that this morning? I looked at it this morning, but I don't know what it's supposed to mean. You signed up for Seder and you haven't signed up for a dish. The, the categories are listed okay. on there that you can... Um, okay, I, I noticed that there are only three people bringing soup. Is that sufficient? No. No. Okay, so um, we need... No. But Dennis, you're getting all fidgety. What do you want? <laughs> I just wanted to remind people that the Seder starts at 6. We don't usually eat till 7.30, so we Correct. have a nibble or something before you Yeah, and there, there will be the, the matzahs on the table that you can nibble on as well. Uh, but we, we, we go through the whole service, the Seder service, and there's a lot that comes before the actual meal. So um, we need, we need uh, a couple more people to make matzo ball soup. Um, anything else that you guys can think of that regarding the Seder? Great. Okay, um, May 5th, graduation party for Thaddeus Van Note. He's graduating high school. You are welcome to come to our house and harass him about the work really starting now. Um, also, for those of you that are aware, we will be having a graduates uh, thing, ceremony, I don't know. Um, the 10th of June, was that right? Well, it's the first Sunday in June. I don't know the then it wouldn't be the 10th. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the math doesn't work on that. <laughs> June 2nd. Second. So, graduates, um, so it'll be Luca. Nathan, you're getting your college degree? Presumably. Presumably. <laughs> so we're going to go in faith that he's getting his degree. Uh, Ethan and Thaddeus. So, uh, if you know of others in our church that are graduating, uh, we want to recognize them June 2nd. Second. Um, she left. Um, help wanted to care for a Stevensville resident. Chris, do you know more about this? Not much. Uh, just somebody contacted Kimberly yesterday and said there's this man in Stevensville who had open heart surgery uh, in, at the end of March, and they've got people lined up to take care of him, but there's a gap of time between May 2nd and 7th where they need somebody to come and stay with him and help take care of him. So Kimberly will have the details if you want to contact her. Yeah, and Kimberly is actually teaching uh, the older kids over in the other building right now. So a uh, prayer meeting for unsaved loved ones, uh, 9 to 12 year old after we dismiss here. Uh, all right, all you Hebrew scholars, there's a test. What does it say? <laughs> What does it translate to? No. Uh, Alex. From <laughs> my family. Yeah. You can't. You you put it up there. You looked it all up. You just ruined it. You ruined it. All right. Uh, so announcement. Any other announcements that didn't cover? Angie. I'm not sure. I was just Easter, Easter breakfast. Yes. Yes. I just looked at him, and okay. he, you know, he, his, he was like drawing my eyes to him. Okay. Uh, next Sunday, Easter morning, uh, Ron has volunteered to make breakfast at 9 o'clock here. Uh, if you would like to participate in that, we need a number so he knows how much to buy. Um, Ron, anything you want to say about that? Yeah. Let me, let me get up here. Yep, come on up. Yeah, so I can see everybody. 
He doesn't know this, but when I get in front of people, I'm liable to preach to you. <laughs> There's the Bible. <laughs> I don't need it. Uh, anyway, for 25 years, thereabouts, I have been in churches, and I have done Easter breakfast on my own for helping people. Now, there's two reasons. One is mostly uh, Easter morning is usually a hectic day for families to get everybody all ready for church. Normally, it's new outfits and everything else. Breakfast is kind of hard to squeeze in with all of the preparations to get the family ready to come to church. So I so spend the time that you would normally have to prepare your breakfast. Just come here and eat. It's easier than eating the candy. Okay, now, the thing I need to know, since I don't know very many of you, um, I don't want to put anybody in the hospital. So I need to know on the piece of paper that you'll sign over wherever it's at. Um, if you have something that will put you in the hospital, get the EMTs here and everything else, I need to know not to fix it. Okay, so if you're allergic to salt and it puts you in the hospital, please say no salt. Okay, because I cook with seasoning. So just remember, I'm fixing a breakfast that is going to put cholesterol higher. So if you got that problem, take an extra pill. I mean, I'm just saying, I, I, I don't cook healthy. I will try to have some things for people that can have, you know, wants to cut down on their diet type of thing, but it won't be totally fat free. Um, so I will have fruit and things like that. Uh, I know some of you are gluten free type people. Um, I will try to have something there that will not be gluten. So that, there's no reason not to come. I, if I know, I will fix it the best I can for you guys so you will not have a problem saying I can't go because I, I can't eat it okay I'm trying to hit everybody but I can't hit everybody okay so but there's still no reason not to come so I'm giving you the extra time to get the kids ready get everybody ready come eat at least you don't have to worry about trying to cook breakfast at home okay now the second reason is sermon uh, the early church met for three things the fellowship that's what I'm having the preaching of God's word, that's his part. Of course, everybody's going to be full and sleepy. He's, he's got an extra job to do. And then the remembering Christ, and that's going to come in with the sermon as well. So we're hitting all three things that the early church did. So there's no reason not to come. I don't know how many, but I'll try to... I know I can feed you. There's no problem. I used to feed thousands when I was in the Navy. So cooking, it's not a problem. As far as the cost goes, I normally do it on my own. But there again, I don't know how many of you are going to be here. So maybe next year. But anyway, normally I take a donation. So if you want to put a little bit in the coffee can up there, whatever, that's fine. If not, don't worry about it. But I'm not going to ask the church to give me a blank check basically to go buy groceries. So it's on me. So you guys can want to contribute, that's fine but you can do it over there after you eat. But you will be well fed. Uh, cinnamon rolls, biscuits and gravy, ham, bacon, sausage, all kinds of good stuff that maybe a lot of us are not, should not eat, but it's gonna be there. And God will bless it, so therefore it's not gonna count. Okay? It's kind of like Thanksgiving and Christmas. It, don't, it won't add up on your calories. Okay? So, no reason. I'll turn it and back for, over. And for those that have never eaten his food, oh. you guys are in for a treat. Oh. She, she, she and, knows. She's, yeah, I know. My baby <laughs> eats food for five years. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So anyway, that's excellent. Thank, uh, Thank you. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Uh, um, so we need a sign-up sheet on the credenza for people to put down how many will be there. And if you have any food allergy. Allergy. Yeah. You can't eat stuff. <laughs> um, all right. Awesome. Thank you for doing that. That's going to be great. All right. If you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 19.
Today we celebrate Palm Sunday. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about Palm Sunday. Um, this ties in really well with the Seder. Um, so we're going to start off, I'm going to read out of Luke chapter 19. We're going to pick up in verse 28. Okay, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of, his, two of the disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this. The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it, just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus upon it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all his mighty works that had been done, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the day will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in, on every side and tear you to, down to the ground and your children with you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, um, most Bibles have little <coughs> headings over the sections in the passage. Anybody got a, a heading over this passage? <laughs> No, no, no. The one we started, 28. Verse 28. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about this journey that he made. Okay. Um, because prior to this, um, Jesus had been with the disciples up at uh, Caesarea Philippi. Um, that's where he told them that upon this rock I will build my church. Uh, he came down, uh, came down through Samaria. One of the towns rejected him, didn't let him stay there. And, and uh, James and John gave their famous quote, hey, shall we call down lightning on them and destroy them? And, and Jesus said, hey, yo, chill. Whoa, relax. Okay, or whatever that equivalent is in Aramaic. Um, so they went somewhere else. They ended up coming down to Jericho, uh, where he met Zacchaeus and had dinner with him. Uh, and then he comes into Bethany, and there he stays with uh, Mary and Martha, Lazarus. He gets anointed. Uh, we find out that uh, Judas is filching from the treasury, seeking to enrich himself. And then they come forward to uh, Bethany, to Bethphage. So if you would go ahead and put that first slide up. Um, now this, this is from our trip um, in 2000, what was it, 15? 15. 15. Um, the area that I'm standing, taking this picture, is the area that the Jews would first see the temple as they come up over the top of the Mount of Olives, okay? 
Now, you'll notice as he's going on through here, uh, you know, he sends the two guys up ahead and he says, you know, get me this colt and bring it to me. It's never been ridden on. I don't know how you would recognize a colt that had never been ridden on, but evidently they did because they got the right one. Okay. And sure enough, somebody came out. I mean, the modern day equivalent would be, you know, you're, you're sitting here in church and, and you look out the window and a couple guys get in your car. And you're like, hey, what are you doing? Oh, the Lord has need of it. I don't know who owned the colt, but wow. Okay. Um, they said the Lord needed it, and he's like, oh, okay, that's good, take it. Okay. So the, this man is gonna, has got to be commended. These are one of the unseen heroes in Scripture that we don't normally think about. You know, we think about David and, and Goliath, and we think about Daniel and the lion's den, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This dude, take it. Okay. So coming down, um, they found the colt, they brought it back, they laid their cloaks on the colt, and Jesus sat on it. Okay. Now the first thing that we need to know, um, this colt was the offspring uh, of a donkey. Um, in Eastern tradition, the king would approach a city in one of two ways. And the way he approached it signified his purpose in coming. Okay? Um, the one way that they would come is they would come riding on a donkey, and that meant that they were coming in peace. Okay? That, that when they're coming here, they have good intent. The other way is they would come on a horse, and that would indicate that trouble's on the horizon. Okay? Now, it's interesting if you overlay this over the passage we read and what comes later in Revelation, Jesus is going to approach Jerusalem in two ways. Right here, we see him coming on the donkey. And as he comes, he is coming to establish peace. Peace between God and man. Okay? Now, if you read down here, oh, by the way, in Revelation, he comes on a white horse. Remember that? Yeah, so that time's not going to be really good for the people that are there. All right? Okay, so um, they bring it. They put the cloaks on. Jesus sat on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Now, I don't know if this is the exact location, but tradition tells us that this is the first place on the Mount of Olives that they would look across and they would see the holy city, and that from there they could see the temple. And I believe this is where they were when they started shouting, because as they saw the temple, they started celebrating, and they would enter into Jerusalem in celebration. Okay? So they're cheering, and, and you know there are those that are with him, and they understand that he's the Messiah, but you got to remember, this is one of the feasts where all of the people had to go up and, and as they're coming in, they're coming with celebration. And so the people are cheering because sometimes people just cheer. You know? You ever watch uh, a, a sport and you watch the crowd and, and something great happens and the guy's looking on his phone and all of a sudden he jumps up and he's cheering and he's shouting and he has no clue why? <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think a lot of the people that were around him because this was a mass of people coming into Jerusalem. It wasn't just the 12 disciples. As a matter of fact, we know that Jesus himself had a large number following him. Okay, But it wasn't even just all of his disciples. Everybody that was going was going up to Jerusalem. And the day is significant. We go back to Exodus and, and the establishment of the feasts. We see that um, prior to the Passover... There is lamb selection day, okay? And you have to take your lamb, and you inspect it, and you hold on to it, making sure that nothing happens to it, and it will be checked over every day, and then on the Passover, the lamb is brought 
to be sacrificed. Okay? Jesus was entering Jerusalem on Lamb Selection Day. He was coming into Jerusalem so that he could be inspected and found flawless, without blemish. Okay? We need to remember that Scripture goes way deeper than ink on a page. One of the things that we, we so easily fall into the trap of is when we read Scripture, we look at it through the lens of our culture and our identity. And a lot of times we miss what's going on because what's happening here didn't happen in our culture. Okay? Um, you know, I, I think probably the closest thing that we have in our culture to this would be the 4th of July. All right? That's, that's about as close as we can come. But you have this entire mass of people coming up to Jerusalem. They're bringing their lambs. They're, they're picking them out. Uh, history tells us, tradition tells us that Jesus actually entered into Jerusalem through the gate that the lambs were brought in for Lamb Selection Day. Okay? Uh, I, I don't know if that part is true or not. Uh, I wasn't there, ironically. Um, so... The Lamb Selection Day, he comes in, he presents himself in the temple, as you find out as you read further on. He presents himself in the temple, he answers everybody's questions, he shows them that he is without blemish. Okay? <laughs> so, reading down a little bit further, okay, so we're, we're here, this is where I believe it's somewhere in this general area that they started cheering and shouting and celebrating. Go ahead and go to the next. Uh, now this, again... Tradition says this is most likely the road that Jesus walked down. Uh, it amazes me how well the asphalt stood up. <laughs> you know, uh, I wish we could get that kind of stuff here. Um, no, it, it's in the general area. Most likely he would have passed through here somewhere close. Going down these streets, um, actually go ahead and go to the next one. Um, there was a, a uh, beggar standing out on the streets. Um, as we walk down. Actually, go back. I want to show you something real quick. Uh, you notice the tops of the walls there? Uh, on the top of the wall, they put broken glass and sharp metal and stuff like that to keep people from going over the walls. Because um, evidently, um, the walls were insufficient. Now, you know, I guess if, if most people see a wall, they automatically wonder what's on the other side. So um, keeps keeps nosy people out. Uh, go ahead and go forward. Uh, as we're walking down, we're coming down the Mount of Olives. Uh, go to the next one here. Um, all the people are cheering. Uh, the Pharisees tell them, uh, hey, tell your disciples to stop. Um, I'm going I'm to come back to that because I think there's a deeper meaning to what's going on here than what we just see. Um, but if you... This, this is... Uh, a Catholic, uh, I just lost the word, church, not a church. Shrine. What? Shrine. Shrine, thank you. Shrine. This is called the Church of the Tear. And if you, you look at the design, it's kind of designed to look like a tear. Again, tradition says that this, in this area, as he's coming down the Mount of Olives, Verse 41, and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Okay? Now, again, this is tradition. We don't know for a fact that it was here that this happened. But tradition says it was in this area that Jesus started weeping. Okay? Now, an interesting note, uh, again, because we, we uh, most of us read this in English, uh, and it's translated from another language, we miss certain things because our language is a, is a lot more confusing and a lot less effective than Greek is, okay? The word that they use uh, when Jesus cries is klaeo, okay? In the Greek, klaeo is a word for crying that encompasses every form of expressing grief. Okay? 
So not just tears dribbling down his eyes, um, not just silent sobs, but actually mourning, even wailing, okay? Right here, Jesus' heart is broken for the city that he's coming to because he knows uh, not very long down the road, 40-some years, it's going to be completely destroyed, okay? He knows what's coming on the people of Jerusalem because they can't see why he's there, all right? Now, just really quick as a contrast, um, if you go to John chapter 11, uh, Jesus, this is at uh, the, the resurrection of Lazarus. Um, he gets word that Lazarus is ill. Uh, the disciples say, well, don't you want to go see him? He says, well, no, uh, we, we got stuff to do. We'll go later. Uh, and then after several days, he said, okay, well, we're going to go see Lazarus because he's sleepy. And, and the disciples are, well, you know, I mean, um, well, won't that make him better? You really want to go and wake him up? Because they didn't understand that Lazarus had passed away. So Jesus comes down. Uh, Martha runs out, meets him. Uh, they send a runner back to Mary. She comes out. Uh, and then, so uh, let's, let's just look real quick here. I just want to read this passage. Um, so he's, he's met with uh, Martha. Uh, and she called her sister Mary. Uh, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. I'm in verse 29 now. Um, so John 11, 29. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, this is Bethany, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Okay, now there's, there's a little twist on here that I don't, I think we don't normally grab. But we know that Mary and Martha were living with Lazarus. So what the, what's the dynamic at play here? Neither Mary nor Martha were married at this time. Whether they'd been married before uh, and a divorce or a death, we don't know. Uh, but we know at this point they were not married, which meant that Lazarus was the re one that was responsible for their care. He's the one that took care of them. Uh, we know that uh, if you, um, your husband died and you didn't have somebody to take care of you, you would go back to your father. If he couldn't take care of you, you'd go to an uncle. And if he couldn't take to you, uh, the nearest relative would take care of you. So we know here that whether their husbands died or whether they were never married, we know that Lazarus was their caretaker. And now Lazarus is gone. Okay? That's not a good thing for women. All right? Especially at this time. Okay? So I think there's more going on than just the loss of their brother. I think they're looking at the loss of their life. Okay? How are we going to do this now? All right? So that, that's just my little two cents in there, okay? Um, so, going down, um, uh, if you had been here, Lord, my brother would not have died, verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said... Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Now, what's interesting here is there's another Greek word for crying, for weeping. And in this case, they don't use kleo. They don't use the expression for, for every, every kind of mourning you can do. They actually use a word, dakruo. Okay? Dakruo uh, means that you shed a tear, okay? Um, it, it's much more uh, passive. It, it's not nearly as demonstrative. And, and so Jesus, he's troubled in his spirit. And, um, you know, I, I don't know what his intention was from the beginning, um, but I think it grieved him 
to see them read. Um, you know, they, they had this understanding that there would be a resurrection at some point down the road, and, and they would see him then. But, but I think, you know, Jesus was troubled, and he wept, okay? So just a few days later, he's coming down the Mount of Olives, and the weeping that he does there is nothing like the weeping at, at Lazarus's tomb, okay? So let's back up a little bit. Um, jump back over here to Luke 11, since that's where we're working out of. A um, couple things that are significant here that we don't really pick up on because we weren't there. Our culture is different. Um, as, as they were coming up to celebrate the Passover, we know that they were coming to celebrate freedom and deliverance. Okay? That's what the Passover is all about. When, when God intervened directly and moved his hand in Egypt to deliver all of Israel out of slavery, this is the, the remembrance. Now remember, everything in the Old Testament has its balance in the New Testament or its fulfillment in the New Testament. Okay? Uh, we see the structure of the tabernacle and the temple. We know that those were designed off of the blueprint of what's in heaven. So those are a copy. Um, and, and looking at Israel being delivered out of bondage from Egypt is a foreshadow of God moving his hand to deliver all people from sin. Okay? So as Jesus is coming down, there's the celebration of going to the Passover. Um, they're going to have the, the Seder dinner. Um, are going to celebrate. Um, but then there's this, this dynamic that happens. Okay, first he's on the donkey. This is to fulfill prophecy. Okay, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 uh, says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he, humble." and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now you look at this picture, and this, this, this actually caused some problems for the Jews in this day. Because you read through the Hebrew Scriptures, and it appears that there are two Messiahs, and two Advents of the Messiah, or, or two different Messiah's Advents. Because you have one um, in Isaiah 53 that is the suffering servant the one that, that is coming as a lamb. And in Zechariah, it talks about him coming on a donkey. And listen to how it describes him, how he's coming. This is the king entering into his city. All right? And he comes, having salvation, being righteous, humble, and mounted on a donkey. Okay? Now, this describes perfectly what Jesus was doing. Because what is what, what does it mean to be humble? Anybody? To not think more of yourself than you ought. To not be prideful. Um, you, you look at why Jesus was going into Jerusalem. He wasn't going there uh, entirely of his own will. Because we find out after the Seder when he goes to Gethsemane, what is his cry? He's crying out to his father, if it would be possible, let this cup pass from me. But not as I will, as you will. Okay. See, there are times God's going to ask you to do something that you're not going to want to do it. And that's okay to say, God, I really don't want to do it. So long as you follow it up with, but not what I want, what you want. Okay? So we see that Jesus is fulfilling this passage out of Zechariah. Um, they start coming down the mountain. They start to celebrate. Um, history tells us if you read Josephus, um, his uh, antic book on uh, antiquities, he talks about the prophecy of the Messiah coming down the Mount of Olives. And so the Jews at Passover would look to the Mount of Olives to see if the Messiah was coming down. Okay, and we, we know uh, from history that several times people proclaimed to be the Messiah came down the Mount of Olives and, and the people were, would get loud and they would get, get excited and, and even get riotous. Um, 
Josephus writes that on at least two occasions this happened, and the Romans went out and settled the riot the, the most efficient way they knew how. They killed everyone. Okay? So as Jesus is coming down the mountain, the Jews are cheering and shouting, and the Pharisees are looking at this going, oh great, you know, if, if they come out and they start slaughtering everyone, Passover's ruined. You know, it's going to put a damper on things. And so I think when they're talking to Jesus, I think first and foremost they're saying, hey dude, you know, these people are cheering you. you got to stop that. But I think beyond that, they're going, dude, we, this is going to be one of the holy days of the year for us. I, don't bring the Romans down on us. Stop it. And I, it's amazing to me how Jesus responds to them. If they stop, the very stones will cry out. You know, Scripture says that all of creation is groaning. Okay? I, I, I don't know how God created a rock. Uh, sometimes I have a lot of similarities with a rock. Um, you know, things just don't penetrate. But I, I don't know that a rock has a soul. Uh, I don't know that a rock has a voice. I don't know how that works. But I don't think Jesus is speaking uh, metaphorically here. I think that if man didn't acknowledge what was going on, nature would. Okay? Um, so, here he comes down. This, this chaos is starting. Um, they look to the Mount of Olives because of Zechariah 14. Verse 4, on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. This is a messianic prophecy. This is why the Jews were looking to the Mount of Olives. And I think, uh, you know, I mean, to get to Jerusalem from parts east, you had to come up through the Mount of Olives. That's, that's just the way you did it. Okay. Um, one thing that I do want to show, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, basically, I turned around. I took the picture of the, the uh, shrine, and then I turned around, and I, I kind of shot a little bit down and to the left. This is a, a Jewish cemetery on the Mount of Olives, because the Jews, they want to be the first one to greet the Messiah when he comes. Okay. So those are all tombs uh, of, of Jews there. And, and uh, um, oh, I just lost his name. Uh, Camp David Accords. Menachem is buried there. Okay. Um, so they're, they're thinking is that when, when the Messiah comes over, they're going to be the first ones to greet him. Okay. Um, so back to this. Um, We know that the Romans had issues with the Jews being a, a troublesome uh, people. Uh, if you read uh, any of your history, um, we know that Pilate was actually sent to Israel, to Ju Judah, not as a favor, but because he supported the wrong guy uh, when, when leadership changed over, and he was sent there as a punishment. You understand that, you understand why he's concerned when the Jews say, hey, if you don't kill him, we're going to send word to Caesar and tell him that you are no friend of his. He's already in hot water with Caesar. He doesn't want to get in more hot water. Okay? So there's a lot of things that play into this that you really have to dig. You're never going to dig deeper than the word of God goes. You, you can't. Okay? So, uh, all of those graves there, Jesus comes down. He's weeping. We call it the triumphal entry or the triumphant entry. Um, I don't know many people that, that uh, are wailing and sobbing in triumph. Uh, although, um, you know, there's a saying that uh, the only thing more grievous than a battle lost is a battle won. Um, because even when you win, you know, I mean, you, the slaughter, it affects you. It changes you. Okay. So Palm Sunday, they're coming down the mountain. Jesus is looking forward in time. He sees what is coming on Jerusalem. He knows it's because their hardness of heart. He knows the price that they're going to pay. And he's weeping because these are his people. This is his city. This is the place where God has put his name. And he knows that they're going to be almost 2,000 years before Israel, the Jews, get to come back to Jerusalem and Israel is once again established as a nation. 
So Jesus is bearing all of this. It's not just a, the, a matter of well, he's going to the cross because when he's coming down, he, the end of this is the cross and then the next part of the story takes off at the resurrection. Okay? But he's also bearing the weight of knowing what's coming on his people. Those people that he chose. And I, I, I think that's why he was every kind of mourning that you can do, he was doing it right there. Because the cost is horrific. Okay? Um, 